Hi, everyone. How we doing? How's it going? Welcome to the Asmati Games 1001 Odyssey's Twitch stream. We're here with uh, a couple folks from the creative development team, and we're going to talk about 1001 Odysseys a little bit. So uh, before we tell you who we are, I want to uh, ask Julia, the creator, hey. what the game is about. How's it going, Julia? Hey, how's it going, Alana? I'm doing hey. great. Awesome. Um, so I'm Julia. I'm the creator and writer for 1001 Odysseys, which is a branching narrative adventure game. And in this game, you play as the humans on the starship, the Odyssey. Now, you're, uh, yeah, you're officers on the starship Odyssey, and you've gone through a portal through a wormhole in space, but the portal has closed behind you, and now you're lost with no way of getting home again. Uh, but in this part of the universe, you find some quirky aliens and some fun worlds to explore, so all is not lost. Um, and this is a super fun uh, branching narrative adventure tabletop game. Awesome. All right, so why don't, so since Julia told us a little bit about her, oh, I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. You'll be <laughs> the last one. Um, we're also joined by Sarah and Trin. So Sarah, you want to tell us what you do for the game? Sarah. Oh, Sarah, you're muted. <laughs> oh, no. Uh oh That's okay. She's doing great, though. You know what? She looks like she's really <laughs> into it. Um, okay, Trin, do you want to tell us what you do for the game? Before? Always. All right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, hi. I am Trin Garitano, and I am um, one of the staff. Uh, staff? I don't know. I'm one of the writers. Yeah, one of the writers. you're on staff. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's been really awesome working on the game. Uh, basically, this is the way I've always described my job is um, Sarah does all of the adult work and puts together the narrative. <laughs> and then um, I come in and I mess it up a little bit uh, with dumb jokes. Uh, but, yeah, so that is me. And then I show up to meetings and I uh, water my plants the whole time and always remind people that it's not me pissing. It's me watering it. <laughs> <laughs> Has definitely happened. It's fantastic. No, Trin brings so much sunshine to all of our meetings, so that's great. Thank and you. Sarah, are you back? Oh no! Uh oh! No, <laughs> we still no. I can see you. You're trying. It's all right. We had you before. We'll get you back. Don't worry about it. Um, I will talk. Okay. Hi, I'm Alana Servanak. I am the art director for Thousand One Odysseys. So I basically I oversee our illustrators and make sure that they're kind of keeping in theme with what we want to do with the game with the writers make sure everything has that fun magical colorful whimsical aspect to it i also do all of the graphic design work so the logo ui packaging rule book icons all that stuff that all falls in my general wheelhouse so um and then yeah i also come into meetings and i listen to everyone's fantastic jokes and they fill my days with joy and i love it so same back at you. Aww, I think my so. <laughs> and I think we're still working on getting Sarah back here. So Julia, you, you kind of started going to what you do, but tell us a little bit more about your daily role and what you work on. Yeah, sure. Um, so I do, uh, well, obviously I do writing and kind of coming up with uh, new characters, new worlds, um, just kind of seeing how far we can push the story. Um, and kind of corralling what, what happens in the universe. Cause it's a lot to come up with. We're coming up with four big stories, uh, about 30 to 32 chapters total, both of all of which will be about a half hour to an hour of gameplay. And that will all include, you know, each chapter is a branching story in itself. So we have to come up with all of those possibilities um, and all of those characters that you'll see uh, in each playthrough. And it's a lot of content to come up with. And it's a ton of fun. Uh, but you're also kind of sitting there and going like, okay, what do I have? What am I going to come up with now? Uh, it's a lot of content. It is. And Sarah, do we have you yet? Nope. Oh, no. <laughs> Can I, can I can I introduce Sarah? Yes, you can. Okay, cool. Yes. Sarah is the resident adult in the room. 
Uh, he's <laughs> one of the smartest and most reliable people that I've ever worked with. Um, she makes sure that we get um, the choose your own adventure that's been going on at plumplum.com done. Um, she is the narrative designer, which means that she designs the entire flow of the game. Uh, and uh, she's just like creative and amazing. How did I do? You give me a. a you, like, sorry, no, uh, uh, I would say out of ten, you got twelve out of ten. You nailed it. <laughs> you did great. <laughs> do we have you, Sarah? One minute. Oh, I'm back. Oh, I, 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 I think this microphone yeah. works, but I can't hear anyone out of these headsets. So oh, it's okay. like we're not saying guess, anything important. I'm not really that good at lip reading. So let's see if this works. Can I hear you guys now? Uh, can you? No. Can <laughs> I can't hear you and me at the same time. Come to <laughs> yeah, why not? Or like hold up the second set of heads of headsets that has the mic that works and just like talk into that headset. That works too. <laughs> this is great. And, you know, this is kind this of like, awesome. this, this feels like uh, a lot of our different meetings because <laughs> we all, most of us work remotely. So it's a lot of just like being like, can you hear me now? Like, am I on? Can you see me? I can hear you, but you can't hear me. I've done a lot of just like talking and I realized that I've had my mic muted and I've been like, oh, I had like this half an hour idea that I now have to say again because my mic was off the whole time. So Big same me, girl. Please. It's it's the norm. All right. Well, Sarah's figuring that out. So we will when she comes back, I mean Trin all already nailed her intro there. That was perfect. Totally. Um Yeah, so I guess I wanna start uh the questions that somebody asked uh, on the Kickstarter, which Thousand One Odyssey is on Kickstarter right now. That's part of the reason why we're here. Uh, it's been under development for how many years now? Uh, over four years. Now. Four years. Yep. Yeah. Which is, you know, I I had kind of been so I've like been working on other stuff, and then when this finally like came onto my desk about a year ago. I was already like, wow, there's so much stuff for this. And it's only like the first story. Oh, my God, there's going to be four stories. That's nuts. But um, somebody asked in the Kickstarter, what got you all interested and started into board games as a hobby? So, Trin, how would you get started in this? Um Honestly, I mean, I think everybody has the story of like, oh, I played Monopoly with my mom and my brother when I was seven years old. You know, like I, I definitely have that too. Um, but like I, I was a video game, like a PC game nerd before I think I was a tabletop nerd. Uh, and I volunteered at PAX and C2E2 and all these conventions. And um, I worked as an events manager uh, at an orthopedic software company. And this is all relevant because after that, I was hired at Cards Against Humanity as their event manager which um like six years ago um and so that kind of um got me like supercharged into this and uh, i'm just enjoying D, D. uh i don't know like what what do you say about that it's like <laughs> i just showed up one day and uh and it was awesome oh sarah are you back hey can, can you hear me yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right we did it fantastic Yes. Yes. So no. Okay. So now that we have Sarah here, even though Trin did your intro, do your intro. Do a better Hi. one. Do it again. No, it was great. I'm, I'm sure Trin said all 100% lovely things about me. Um, what I do is I take care of kind of like the continuity stuff and making sure that when you go from point A to point B or point A to point D, it still makes sense as a player and you're experiencing one continuous narrative even though behind the scenes, everything is kind of like this crazy mush of like an action here and a location there and how did they all come together and stuff like that. So that's what I really focus on a lot of the time. Nice. Nice. Yeah. You are, you're keeping everything together because without you, everything will be put together with like tape and bubble gum. So <laughs> thank you for being you. <laughs> um, how did, Sarah, how did you get started into board games as a hobby? Uh, I don't well, like as a kid, right, I started board games with my siblings and we would play whatever my parents had around the house, like old stuff, um, like Trope or Avalanche or, you know, card games with my grandma and things like that. And then mm -hmm. eventually, you know, you become an adult and you play <laughs> kind of like more adult games. We used to play things in college. We used to play like uh, Spank and various storytelling games. And then one day I was like, 
you know, I have some free time and um, Asmati Games needs some artwork and now I kind of like stuck around. Yeah. <laughs> to do like, uh, it was like for fealty and I was like, you know, this is actually kind of cool and hey, there's like this whole community around this. There are these conventions you can go to and people you can meet and it gives you like a way to connect to people because you have these games that you can play together and then talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. How about you, Julia? Yeah, so I mean, I've I've been a gamer like forever, but you know, I didn't realize that there was this kind of hobby board gaming thing uh, until shortly before I started working for Asmadi, and I was like, oh my god, there's this whole other area of nerddom I didn't I didn't know about. Um, so it's really been quite a journey, um, and I love it. It's so fun. It's so cool. Um, so yeah, awesome. Yeah, I know. I love how we all just kind of like fell down this like rabbit hole of like networking and then we were like and here we all are at Asmati yay go team and it's been great because we all work great together so it's been really fun I mean that's kind of how it goes it's not like you can major in board games and in college right get get your (laughs) masters and gming you know it's uh you figure out you like it and then you go forward yeah yeah oh and uh Mike thank you I um yeah I'm really more of a um I'm really into video games, but there is a lot of crossover between video games and board games. Like, I played stuff back in the day. Like, I used to love playing Uno. Uno was my jam. I was like, (laughs) yes, the best. But now, you know, it's the same thing where you're like, okay, now I can, like, play some, like, adult board games. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that sounds more grown up, I think, than I meant it to. But you know what I mean. (laughs) um, and, you know, like going to Gen Con and stuff like that, everyone was like, let me show you these awesome games. And I was like, cool. And so I am fairly new into playing board games and tabletop games, uh, but it's cool. I like it. And then I started at Asmati, uh, kind of similar to Sarah, where uh, one of my friends was working for the company at the time. And then I, she was like, we need a design person. You interested? And I was like, hell yeah, I am. Let's do this. And uh, I've been around for five years now. Never got rid of me. I just, I stayed. I was like, you know what? I know you need me for this one project, but then I just kind of stayed forever. So it worked out. And I was like, all right. Um, so we already have somebody in the chat that was wondering, this is in r- relation to the game itself. Uh, Cho, the best seeker, what's up? They said, are those four stories in 1001 Odyssey supposed to be played in a specific order? Uh, no, they're going to be uh, sort of standalone stories that you'll be able to play. So you can start with any one of them and be able to jump right in. Um, yeah, they're standalone episodes. Cool. So you, the three of you have mostly, the stuff that we've been showing off has been from story, which one? Or. Or. All right. This is cool. the fourth one that we presented at Gen Con, so now it's story four forever. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can go out of order. All right. Yeah. Uh, cool. So is there, like, a, a general overall story, like an overarching story that all of these are contained under, or are they considered separate standalone stories? So, like, there's the overarching um, plot line of, humans going out into the galaxy and what happens then but uh it's not it's not like you have to do story three and then story four or else story four won't make sense story four is fine if you just jump right into it okay very cool very cool so i the next question i want to ask in our thousand and one questions which might not even be a thousand and one questions we'll see um what species in a thousand and one odysseys is the best the best man yes. i don't know if, if we could ever say the best but maybe like which species we all relate to so for me it's the plum plum because the plum plum <laughs> have weird uh, so they're little turnip people and they're adorable uh but they also have like garden magic hands yeah julia's holding up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they've got garden magic hands and uh so they can uh like uh, have plants uh that 
basically plants bend to their will. And um, I'm a, a bit of a nerd for indoor gardening, as might be evidenced by the, that's all oh, plants. Oh, they're beautiful. Wow. There's plants it. in there. Well, so right now we're in my office room, which is also what I call the greenhouse. So all of my sick plants uh, are in this room. Uh, and now this is where I do all my plant experiments. So for me, it is the plum plum. Love it. And I'm always like so into seeing all of your plant adventures because for anyone who doesn't know, Trin is like seriously master of plants. Oh, look at that little guy. Oh, it's so precious. <laughs> How about you, Julia? Who do you relate to? Um, I also, I love the plum plum. They're, they're so cute. They're these three foot tall uh, radish creatures. And, you know, I love how they kind of live in harmony with their environment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that they're just so helpful and uh, so friendly. I'm also partial to the Felici, which are the, the cat people from the desert planet Aravine. Yes. Uh, they're just super fun. And they're, they're kind of a little bit like cats on Earth. They're just they're kind of super proud of themselves and maybe a little bit too serious. But they're so funny to write. I love writing for them. Awesome. How about you, Sarah? I'm going to say the lacquer dudes just because they're so, like, <laughs> relaxed so and they surprised. get along with people. And it's like, you know, there's something really beautiful that you can look at it in space and I'm going to share it with you. Just come along. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you just, like, randomly showed up in your spaceship through this portal thing that no one knows how it works. I'm going to, like, be your friend. I'm going to make sure that you can understand everybody. I'm going to introduce you to my family. I'm going to show you all the cool <laughs> stuff that I know about. And I, I think that's just really the great thing about the Lacker Dudes. Man, just Sarah, so chill. I would have thought you were going to say the Elements just because they're so, they're so smart and they got all their, like, tech stuff together. And that's you, man. <laughs> I mean, like, if I had to have people working with me from this universe, it would be elements. I would like to have nice interns <laughs> on this project, right? You know? Fair. Um. <laughs> Very fair. And, you know, for me, it's like I, I uh, everyone's already gone into about why the Plum Plum are so great because they are. Um, but the elements are fantastic. And especially please meet Tath. Tath is the best. I, I, I can't even like Trin, please tell us about Tath. Oh, so Tath is an element who is also a custodian of some nature to the, this greenhouse on Brumagum, which is the planet of the Plum Plum. Uh, and and he, he is a guardian. He takes his job very seriously. Uh, and he was kind of written as like a mashup between um, Groundskeeper Willie from The Simpsons and then also like... <laughs> He's somehow Southern also as well. I'm not sure. He carries two switchblades. Um, but Tap is like, he's this, he's my strange little lizard baby that lives inside of the game. And you may or may not even come across him. In fact, I think I only ran one play test ever where Taff came up, uh, which kind of tells you just like how branching the stories are, is that there are some characters you just might never meet and then go do it again and, and then you meet them. Uh, but yeah, Taff, Taff's my weird little baby who kind of <laughs> talks like this. I love it, especially like the groundskeeper Willie parallel, who is like one of the best characters in The Simpsons ever. So <laughs> I was like, yes, this this is my guy. I'm into like, him. He takes his job very seriously, uh, but he's got like just a few. When I say screws loose, I mean that in like the best way possible. Like he's 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 an intense person. That's good, and you need that level you gotta of be to wrangle them plants. <laughs> wrangle wrangle them carnivorous creatures. It's no, it's like just the two switchblades really makes everything. I'm just so mad all the time, but I love it. It's like don't we all feel that in some way, shape, or form at some point in time? Do. Yeah. Yeah, which, you know, there's also another question where it's like, what is your favorite thing about Insula that players will probably never encounter because there are so many different branching paths? So, Trin, would you say that is your favorite? That, that you would be the answer to that question for me as well, right. too. Right. Just that whole side story of, like, literally wrestling a carnivorous plant to the ground and stabbing him. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only violent part of the game, and it's not violent. violent. <laughs> <laughs> You do what you gotta do. It's all right, you know. It's like yeah. you you do it up, Tath. That's fine. You gotta do you survive. <laughs> How about you, Sarah? What is your thing that you think the players might not see? 
So there's these these items that you can get to put in your inventory, right? And um, we haven't put it into story four because it's from one of the older stories, but you can get this item and you bring it back to a place and it's just this adorable little critter. And you can follow this adorable little critter around and she's just, she's so cute and she's so lively, but <laughs> you only can actually interact with her if you bring her back to the same location where you brought her from in the first place. So you have to like play through twice. Oh. I think, I think it's kind of like that kind of stuff. And in story four that we've actually written, there's like, um, there's a quest, which is an optional quest, and it's hard to complete everything because you have to get like all these specific things, but at the end you get this whole song that comes out, and it's really amazing, and I love that too. But it's hard to get to, so. Ooh, that's good. That's, that's good that we can challenge people then, which it's, you know, that's going to be one of the stretch goals that we hit with the Kickstarter was the achievement medals. Uh, which oh, yay! Those... Yeah, we hit it! Hit it. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. so, woo, celebrate! Um, so that's going to be a really fun way for players if you're kind of stressed out about not seeing all of these different side stories that's going to be a really great way to make sure that over the course of multiple playthroughs if you have to you're going to be able to see it all if you really want to like work your whole way across the galaxy and do everything so that'll be good julia what's your favorite thing about insula the players will probably never encounter Oh gosh. Um, well, we've written a lot of description text for locations, and not and players won't be able to see every single location. And a lot of it is, you know, beautifully written, and it's like very engrossing. And you're like, oh, I want to go to this place, but you might never see it because there's so many different places that you can explore. Mm -hmm. um, for characters, there's one character in story four, and you'll know her as soon as you run into her. Uh, she's someone who thinks she's maybe a little bit more famous than she actually is. <laughs> um, but she is one of my favorite characters. I love writing her. And as soon as you meet her, you'd be like, oh, that's the person Julia was talking about. I recognize her immediately. All right. You know, I think one of my favorite things, and I, so when I, when I played the game at Gen Con, um, me and my friend Jay, we were like, we're going to make every like bad, there are no bad decisions, but we were yeah. like, we're going to make like the chaotic decisions, right? <laughs> And we encountered, obviously, in this story, you are on the planet of Brumagum, but there is a certain character that you can encounter that takes you to Brumagurn. Brumagurn. <laughs> which is, we start to say <laughs> Brumagurn. And so if you meet a very seedy-looking guy that is like, hey, you want to come to uh, this place? I can't really tell you anything about it. You should go. You should go. A lot of players were like too nervous to go. They were like, no, this feels like something bad is going to happen, which is why me and Jay, we were like, let's do it. Yeah. Oh, my God. I can't wait. Like, I hope something bad happens because we were just like so ready. But the, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think the thing to emphasize is that there are no wrong choices in this game. There are no choices that will lead you to a dead end or that will uh, kill, kill off your character. Um, all oh, kitties. Oh, we have yes. kitties. <gasps> She's yes. Rosa trying to get on Broadcast my lap. Oh my god, that is one of Trin's cats. It's roast piece. She's got only three <laughs> legs, which is the number that she needs. <laughs> Julia, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no. Yeah, please continue. I love kitty. Um, <laughs> where was I? I literally lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so it was about Burger. Oh, uh, yeah, there's no wrong choices. There's only different paths that you can take. Yes. Which is always really good and important to remember because it's easy to play a game the way you would if you feel like you're kind of like a safe person. But maybe if you want to be just a super chaotic random person, you can also do that. And you will find dramatically different stories and different choices. So I think that you would have a good time. I do, too. <laughs> I think what's fun about writing the game is figuring out, okay, what would be the fun thing to do? What would be the craziest thing that could happen? And how, how can we possibly incorporate it into the story? Mm -hmm. Right. For sure. And I think, like, there's a lot of times where I'll write something and I'll be like, no, this is not weird enough. Like, <laughs> how can I put more weird in this? <laughs> Someone help me with the weird. 
<laughs> and then we go through like a couple more iterations. And it's like, ah, yes, that is bizarre. Let's do that. You know, like every now and again, I'll say like something like, yeah, like, you know, I'm the one who adds in the weird stuff. But Sarah is the one who put in the planet wide pillow fight. So <laughs> I just want to say we are getting weird from many directions on this game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel like sometimes in a meeting, like, somebody just drops, like, a dad joke or just a really, like, ridiculous plant pun. And then it's like, well, it's in the game now. Like, our hands are tied. That's that's how it is. It's it was basically, like, the first meeting that we all had. And we were talking about Blast from the Chloroplast. And we were just like, yeah, this is it. Yeah. This is fun. <laughs> and that's what it became forever. And I'm most glad. God, so yeah. Blast from the Chloroplast is the title for Story 4. Oh, good point. Nobody knows what that is. Okay, cool. Blast from the chloroplast. Whoever right. came up with that, I have to tip my hat. It was unfortunately me, and I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> no, that was you should brilliant. never be sorry. We I love dare you. you. <laughs> puns, they leave a terrible taste in my mouth. But they're so delightful. Delightful puns. They're very delightful. Um, somebody asked in the chat, how much of the world building is collaborative? which I feel kind of is related to this discussion we're having right now. I have a good, I have an answer for that. Um, yeah. It, it, wow. That's a really good question because, so I've seen teams take on the world building in a few different ways. One, they just kind of like, they they take the story and then that's the story and that's what they're doing. And then some people will play the game and, and this is my favorite way to play it is when, um, so I have to back it up because not everybody knows what's going on with this game. Um, so everybody playing the game, if you play it with more than one person, you can assign a title to each person. So there's, um, and actually, if somebody could, we have Commander, we've got Ops. And those, yep. and commander, Operations, Navigation, Navigator, excuse me, and Information. Right. So when people take those roles stupid seriously, it's <laughs> awesome. Because the commander is in charge and, like, breaks ties in decision-making. But sometimes the commander will be like, you better read that passage with feeling or I'm assigning it to someone else. And and that's, like, the best is when people just, like, fall into those roles. Um, I also had a great play test with people who were, like, really committed to doing a different amazing voice for every character when they read them. Oh, I um, love when people do that. It was uh -huh. so good. Dude, this, okay, the best thing that ever happened was this British dude was playing the game, and he was like, you know what, I'm not good at funny voices, but if I play up my British accent really, really, he did it for Sarban, <laughs> which none of you in the chat knew, knew who that is, but he's he's an elements who's like a really uptight dweeb, um, and so <laughs> he was talking like this, and like, it was just so much fun, uh, and yeah, no, it's just when people really like buy in and decide like, I'm going to have a good time right now. Um, I mean, that's really the the mentality, I think, to enjoy anything. Um, mm -hmm. But the world building is really expanded, I think, in people um, like leaning into their roles and leaning into, okay, this is what, he, this is the inflection. This is what they mean. So mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's great. That And, you know, as, especially to comment on that, it's when People kind of, I, I found when people are demoing and uh, they're the people you least expect to get like super into it, but then they kind of drop their guard and they're like, no, you know what? I'm going to do the ridiculous voices. I'm going to take the the different roles that we have seriously. And I'm going to be the Jean-Luc Picard of this game because I'm the commander and you're not. I think like that's been so yeah. fun. You see like just uh, an even higher level of just like interaction with the game that is just like really fun to watch. Yeah, like, uh, I've learned to not judge a bro by his MMA t-shirt. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> like, the more muscles, usually the better time they're going to have. Because they're like, oh, I don't care, whatever. Like, let's just go for it. And I'm like, yes, I'm so glad. Thank you. You've been really great. Uh, so somebody said, uh, from what little I've seen from gameplay, info is a little more than human wiki. Is there more to that role? So info is, it is a lot of what is all this stuff that we're encountering because you're encountering a lot of stuff and you have very little context for it. But it's also in charge of the passport, which is the save file, and that lets you keep track of what every mission is. So when it's on the board, it just says like... Sorry. Oh, it just says like okay. two, and info can say, well, what does two mean? Ah, two means we're looking for a sleeping plum plum. 
And so they kind of like help interpret the game board. And they're also in charge of the location guide, which is um, kind of like the tourist guide to Insula and what can you expect to see at every location and confirmation of all the coordinates and things like that. So it's not necessarily a role that is very concretely dictated by the storybook itself, but it is very essential in understanding what's going on. Mm -hmm. And everybody should have it and the opportunity to like voice the characters and help make decisions and et cetera. So no matter what role you have, you have an active part in what the next thing is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely the more people you have playing, the more you want to try and come to a consensus about where you want to go and what you want to do. Uh, and hopefully your commander doesn't just ignore all of that and is like, well, I choose this. <laughs> Which we haven't, I don't know, have any of you seen that yet? Has anyone just come in and been like, I'm, t I'm charting the course here? Well, it's the tiebreak vote, right? It's yeah. Not like, yeah. It's not a dictatorship. It's the, oh, we can't come to a consensus on this, so I'm going to be the commander and decide to go and do the thing. I mean, I've seen a full-on yeah. mutiny before. Ooh. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Like, they were like, you're not moving fast enough. Bye. <laughs> Making it for you. Wow, that's intense. I love it, though. Um, so, Sarah, I want to, this is kind of like in your, your section here. What tools do you use, particular software, whiteboards, corkboard, whatever, do you use to keep track of all the narrative branching options? Because there are a lot, and yeah. it's overwhelming, and <laughs> I'm glad you do it so that we don't have to do it, because every time I look at it, I'm like, ah. So there's this app I use, it's called Real Time Board, and it basically is a collaborative whiteboard online app, um, and I sent a screenshot, I don't know if we have it, ah! Oh, there it is. There it is, so this is the uh, sanitized version. What I did was I took out all of the text about what was happening, uh, and what you can see here is, this is a very small portion of chapter one, where you kind of, you start the story, you have the introduction, and it starts unlocking locations, which is all the yellow stuff, and then the teal stuff is kind of like the momentum progress that you make. And then below that, we have like a ton of options. It's basically like a smorgasbord of options that are potentially possible that players might encounter. And so as the player, you would go through and you choose exactly one of those and you would experience that. But from the back end, I keep track of all of the ones that players will definitely have as an option. So you have the action, mission, and then location. So that's always there. And sometimes if you've unlocked other locations or other app actions, you'll have different options and stuff. And I keep track of all of those. So there's like these pools, basically, I call moments of um, stuff that can happen, mm -hmm. and then stuff that can happen later, and then stuff that happens after that. <laughs> <laughs> and I make sure that all the stuff that is written in each pool can be told in any order so that as players go through them, they make sense, like a single story. <laughs> How often do you hit a moment um, where you realize, have you ever had a moment where like something just goes to nowhere and you're like, uh oh, and you have to like go back and like sort through everything again and redistribute everything? There was a little bit of the Gen Con testing that we did of chapter four of story four, where the game just got itself into a state that I hadn't anticipated correctly of like, oh, and now you're out of actions, but you haven't actually completed the last mission yet. Um, so I have to look, watch that very carefully, and I do a lot of checks of, okay, can I make sure that people are completing these missions? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And that's what all the, like, the green bars on the side are keeping track of completing the missions. So I can look at it at a glance and say, uh, okay, they can get this card from here, they can get this card from here, and that'll complete the mission. And they'll always be able to go here and get this card, and they might be able to go here or here and get the next card to complete the mission. So it's it's a format that I've developed that makes sense to me, at least. Um, <laughs> to make sure as long as it makes sense to someone. Because <laughs> everything... <laughs> so I try passing them around, and it's just kind of like, you what? <laughs> it makes sense in my head. Sometimes I feel like we all look at it and we're just like, all right. I mean, <laughs> so they're translating, sense. yeah. <laughs> Which yeah, is and then, great. 
playtesting is like a big part of that too. Of yes. like, I, I think it's good, I think it works, and then someone else will touch it and they'll be like, no, you missed this one thing over here and go back through, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mostly it works. So for, I want to ask this, I want to use that as another question um, for Trent and Julia. Like, how has playtesting affected what you've worked on? Uh, do you ever have a moment where somebody doesn't really respond to a certain story or a certain character or somebody really likes something? And you're like, oh, well, maybe I should put more of that in. Um, how how is your the feedback you've gotten affected your work? Oh, it's been super helpful, especially since this has been in development for a while. Every time we go to Gen Con, every time we go to one of the other conventions, being able to see people play the game and read it out loud is so helpful. Because a lot of times we've been, you know, writing this for a while. And, you know, I might like the jokes, but I'm like, okay, is someone else going to laugh at this? You, <laughs> right. know? you know, I think it's funny. I like it. But, you know, when you hear someone else reading it and you hear someone else laugh, you're like, okay, that worked. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see what how how that works out. Yeah, uh, same. And and honestly, like a lot of it kind of reinforced um, our instincts to me, mm -hmm. you know, like um, every now and again, I'll think, you know what, this is too weird. But then <laughs> but it just turns out that like, you know, people who play games are also weird, you know, like, right. again, like the, the the planet wide pillow fight. I was like, maybe that's going to be too weird or um, there. I, mean, I don't want to give away like major plot points or anything, but like certain characters, Taff is, is one of them, too. Where I was like, this is man, this is going to be like way too much for people. Uh, but it's not. It's it's just, you know, everybody just kind of rolls with it, which is which is really cool. So just kind of talking about some of our inspirations, we definitely had, if you're familiar with the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series or really anything by uh, the sci-fi author Douglas Adams, his stuff is super surreal, super out there. Um, and one of the games that we originally took inspiration from for this was Tales of the Arabian Nights, where you're kind of uh, walking around the world and just getting into the, like the weirdest hijinks, like stuff just happens to you. Uh, and it's a very old game from the seventies. So it, it has a, you know, it's a game of its time, but we were sort of like, we looked at this and we were like, wow, this is a super cool kind of game. How can we, how can we do a story game uh, for today? Mm -hmm. Which is awesome. Yeah. I, when I remember a couple of years ago when, you know, you started working on it pretty sincerely and, I was like, well, that sounds, I haven't played anything like currently that sounds like that. And I think that it is refreshing that it's so easy to make space really dark and scary and, yeah. um, you know, just kind of bleak. And it's like, we have enough of that kind of on earth anyways. So the fact that you can have an intergalactic pillow fight, I think is just something that's so refreshing. Every time I see the stories that you all are writing, I'm like, this makes me feel like happy, which I think for space can kind of be very different than, um, what a lot of other things do in that realm just warm interplanetary fuzzies mm, feels so nice and i love that because you know what and we've kind of gone into this on plumplum.com with the difference of making something family friendly versus childlike which if you don't mind talking about it again here for anyone who hasn't read what we've written there um how do you approach that so the difference between like kid friendly and and childish is you know uh, childish is something that's generally going to only appeal to you know young children and that's fine that's that's good content for kids but when we say kid friendly we want something that's accessible to all ages and that everyone is going to enjoy so we kind of have jokes and situations and characters and worlds that you know appeal to kids but also appeal to adults as well there's several different layers in there um and we want this game to be accessible to everyone and we want everyone to get something from it so the jokes can be highbrow they can be you know silly puns we have so many silly puns <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> So we really wanted this to be to be an, an accessible game for all ages. 
One thing that I really appreciated about our tone is, so at first when I started, was because I started on staff like way after Julia had started working on this project. She had been working on it years before I joined. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, I come from a background of having worked at Cards Against Humanity, which is a very <laughs> yeah. different vibe. Uh, and like, and so in my mind, I was like, let's see what I can sneak in here. But like, that's not the point. The point is for everything to be enjoyed by everyone everybody, which I think is a very different vibe and, a, and a really a better vibe. Like if you think about like, sometimes like, sometimes I can be really put off by like weird sneaky sex jokes that are like snuck into like children's <laughs> cartoons. Like that's a little right. bit much, you know? Uh, and that's what I love about our game is that like, uh, it's not just that everything is like friendly for somebody younger. It's that everything is enjoyable for everyone, which I appreciate a lot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Let me. Oh, somebody. Another good Kickstarter question here. What kind of personal human tech level are we talking in this setting? Since we're talking about the setting anyways, um, you know, what. Uh, Julie, I think you kind of started responding to this on yeah. Kickstarter before. Yeah. So that was actually a really interesting question because I was like, you know, I kind of assumed they are talking about kind of stuff like okay has has have humans kind of have humans kind of crossed the line where they almost aren't recognizably human in terms of being able to interact with technology such that they're almost I don't know cyborgs or or maybe robots even and that hasn't quite happened yet um again we want to make this kind of a, a feel good uh, story, a feel good environment. So I was, as I was reading that question, I was like, well, I don't know if I would want, you know, a smartphone or a smartphone like device attached or embedded or part of my body. I think I would probably go crazy. Um, <laughs> also, if you've ever read the book, I'll digress a little bit. If you've ever read the book called, uh, feed by, I believe the author is MT Anderson. I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, but it's a really good kind of uh, talking about what happens when people have kind of, like you said, kind of like a, a smartphone in their brain. Um, and it's it's kind of a dark tale. Anyway, <laughs> I read that and I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is just not for me. Do not want. No. <laughs> just saying <laughs> it, bro. <laughs> um, so the way we kind of, so the way I kind of went with that was that, you know, sure, people can, can have these embedded tech devices, like for health, and maybe kind of maybe sort of mental uh, acuity or to enhance a lifespan. Uh, but we're not going in a dystopia direction. No, sir. Good. Good. <laughs> Which, again, is, you know, that that kind of falls into the that is pretty common to see. Especially like, you know, people are like, oh, we left the planet because everything's wrecked. And w how I guess kind of how does humanity come into play here in a thousand one odysseys? Are they going into space just specifically to explore or is there a reason that everyone had to leave tell us a little bit more about the human aspect of that uh so specifically uh nothing is wrong <laughs> all Sorry, right i'm getting i'm getting a, i'm getting a message from the mic from the feed uh bears took over the city oh that's okay what been, that's what i've been <laughs> told right. to read. Uh, that's good that's that's now the canon um, that's it making it up as we go along that's what we do <laughs> um so, so what happened was, is that every, actually everything is fine on earth. Everything is fine and dandy. Uh, we've just, we're in the future, uh, a few hundred years in the future. Uh, we've kind of reached a, a semi-utopian state. Um, <laughs> I'm reading the chat. Oh no, polar bears were doomed. Oh no. Polar bears came down. <laughs> No, that assumes there will still be glaciers left. No. Well, but so here's the thing. Like, I <laughs> am a pessimist. I really am. But when I think about humanity's future, I, you have to look historically at humans. We have pulled shit out of our ass. Oh, I don't know if I, I'm allowed to say. Can I swear? Go ahead. Okay. Do it. <laughs> we have pulled shit out of our ass at the last minute for centuries, you know, like there are so many times where we should have been completely wiped out. And I, I'm not saying that like, you know, there's not going to be major catastrophe and, and et cetera, et cetera, in our future. But I still have this faith in the Star Trek next gen, uh, ideal of what the future is. I still have this faith that like, you know, maybe things will get trashed, but we build it up again. And that's what I, I tap into when I think about a thousand and one odysseys, you know, mm -hmm. I think about like, ideally, 
we will get our stuff together and go say hi to aliens and make some friends. Like, doesn't that sound great? That sounds That's so what nice. I want. I want to think about that every day until that is put into the universe and I live that reality. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I feel you. Like, it's it's sometimes really, really hard to enjoy science fiction or enjoy things that are set in the future when we're at this time in humanity's history that is so full of upheaval. Um, but I don't think that we lose anything by uh, daydreaming and being optimistic and uh, thinking well of humanity. Right. Yeah, and I think that, yeah, I, I just, that has been, I, I think that's, it's what lends itself to the art style so much too and why I think that the narrative and the art is such a good match for each other because yeah. it's just, it's just fluffy and nice. And yeah, maybe like some bad stuff might happen or there might be some bad things out there like lurking around in the space bushes or whatever. But overall, you know, I do agree because I am also of the pessimistic mindset. And it's like, no, you know what? I like that idea of maybe we just got it together one day and then we work together and we were like, now we can go to space and it's not a problem and it costs like four bucks. <laughs> you can just go and meet like nice vegetable people and you can go have wacky adventures with them. Yeah, I'm humanity is not what, ready for space yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. in the 1001 universe, we, we've paid our dues and we are ready to fly. <laughs> Everyone just has like a really nice disposition. Like we're basically all Canadians just going out into space. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want. I want humanity to turn into Space Canada. Is that so wrong? <laughs> we can do it. I love it. Good. This is something to work for. We're doing it. It sounds great. <laughs> so what for you three has been the most challenging part of designing 1001 Odysseys? Now that we're talking kind of more into the meat of the overall underlying themes of it. Oh, I have an answer for this. It oh, I want to is... hear it. Oh boy. Okay. So the first time I like really played the game was at Gen Con because as Alana mentioned, we are all mostly remote. Uh, and man, I really did not have a good mental grasp on our game until I literally <laughs> played it. And like, and it gave me, and I've always had mass amounts of respect for everybody I've worked with, but like, I'll tell you what, like nothing gave me respect for Sarah. Like when <laughs> we played at Gen Con and she's just fixing shit on the fly, you know? <laughs> uh, so for me, my biggest challenge was that, uh, man, it was hard to even read the script because there's so many different divergent paths and it took a really long time to kind of like learn that language and be able to put my brain in it. Um, but like we got there. Um, but yeah, so I, so for me, I guess the, the, the short answer is so many choices. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. And I know that's true that Gen Con, this past Gen Con, I would come in every morning to like set up and I have like my coffee and I'm sitting down and Sarah was like, ah, we, we had to change this thing last night because someone got into an eternal loop that they couldn't escape. Right, right. To fix it. Like, Give me all of your scene fours. I want them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Sarah, what has been the most challenging part for you? So for me, like, so we spent a long time developing the really, the simple looking system that we have of action, mission, location. And we had like all these times where we kept trying to put like different gameplay elements with it. Like we had some crew cards and you had to combine a certain amount of attributes and we had this and that and we had all these other things that kept trying to push their way into the game of like more gameplay type elements, more gamey game, 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 game. We're like dice, do we want dice? Do we want something that <laughs> random? And then, so the hardest part was actually taking a step back from that and saying, no, the choice is the mechanic. We don't need another mechanic. Just have the choice. You make the choice, you live with the choice, and you don't have to do any of the like less nice things about, oh, I wanted to make this choice, but I didn't have the cards I needed. Or I wanted to see where that went, but I rolled wrong and failed the, the I failed my roll and I had to do the bad choice instead. Mm -hmm. um, so it was like just really getting a sense of what the game is and then standing up for the choice as the mechanic so that you can just make your choices. That's what your story becomes. Yeah. Awesome. How about you, Julia? Uh, well, my feed is telling me bears. 
Okay. Uh, it was right. theirs again. <laughs> All right. Uh, no. Um, so, so, uh, world, so there's world building and there's story writing. And those are two completely different tasks. So in the beginning, we were doing a lot of world building, creating uh, these different alien races, uh, along with Alice Dutton, um, one of our other co-writers. Um, Hi, Alice. Alice. I miss Alice. Pour one out for Alice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, coming up with worlds and, and different alien races, and we're like, okay, we have some cool stuff here. We have some great worlds. We just got a bunch of stuff. All right, now what's the story going to be? You need to have a, a story that's compelling and that's interesting. Anyone who writes, you know, uh, a fantasy or a sci-fi story, or really any kind of story, there's going to be a lot of stuff in the background that you're never uh, going to see, but that helps everything come together. That helps everything uh, work well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've we've written so many things over the years. We've written so many things uh, <laughs> that are never actually going to be published, but that are vital uh, to writing the actual uh, stories and, and branching paths that will become part of the game itself. We actually have our own dedicated wiki. <laughs> we do. <laughs> That's true. It's very it's terrifying already. Yeah. It's so much. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, for me also, it's we're because we're we've gotten the gameplay now to support how we want to guide it through the story, but there's always. There's a lot of trial and error. And some of the things that people have noticed thus far about the Kickstarters, they're like, well, the cards don't really look like they match everything yet. And that's because they don't. That's because they are early prototypes where we have been, we've gone already showing the game off at Gen Con through a couple of different design iterations. We had square cards that you rotated. So you had your icons to line up with, you know, to correspond with certain choices. We've, messed around with the player board now we switched the card from being vertical to horizontal and um it's all gonna look you know i usually don't have the illustrators work on like a background or something like that until we're absolutely positive that the card is going to look that way that there's going to be something in the middle of the card slightly to the right instead of at the bottom left because then they'd have to do it all over again so it's been you know it's it's always it's always kind of tough with a game when you're kind of fumbling through that process, trying to figure out like, okay, how do we have the idea? How do we make it work? And uh, especially because this is the biggest game I think we've ever worked on that has the most moving pieces at one time, it's been even more of, okay, how do we get this to kind of progress and do what we want to do? But I think we're just about there. I think we got it. It's like every time I'm like, okay, this is the one. I feel really good about this, but <laughs> it's 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 a lot. And you know, this is it's a big game, and it's there's a lot of different. It's it's already gone through so many iterations, but I feel like we're in the streamlined. Like, okay, we're getting there. We're yeah. in the home stretch process of like just finishing up everything. And that's how I feel about that. Um, writing story as we speak. Oh, are you really? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that would be like in character for you, like just always, <laughs> always working. You always got like, what has been the most like random inspiration that all three of you have had for like a certain character or a certain idea? Like, is that have you like been out having lunch or something and you look at like a salad that had a radish in it and you're like, <laughs> radish people, this is it. This is no, it. it. Is I really got funny. it. <laughs> I kind of wish that was a thing because that's a lot better than what I have. I was just like, you know, I was coming up with races back in um, uh, 2014. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> back in the <laughs> back in the mid 2010s. Um, and I was like, I need a cute race. I need a cute, <laughs> tiny race that's friendly. And, you know, I was kind of trying to round out kind of our, our cast of characters here. Because, you know, you want each race to, to be its own thing and to be unique, but to also kind of fill a, a slot, kind of, to fill an archetype. So I was like, I need some cute peeps. And then um, it just kind of formed in my brain. Good. I love it. Um, yeah. For for me, um, we mentioned Tath earlier and Groundskeeper Willie, but Tath is actually named after 
a girl I used to drink with in college. Uh, she, <laughs> she stayed with Tabitha, and she went by Tath, and like she was like the weirdest person that I ever knew and she was just kind of like um like she could just explode at any moment you know those kind of people who will like go to a party and like maybe light a fire in the sink and you can't really trust them that much <laughs> yep um so that was that's my my inspiration for that and also just in general um we've had a lot of like plant stories and as I mentioned before I'm a big weird plant nerd um and so you'll find um some really like deep cut plant people references like a lot of names are very like for plants and such um so yeah that's me <laughs> fantastic how about you sarah uh for my inspiration it's like i have an architectural background so a lot of it comes from places and then i imagine the people that are in those places so i kind of go about it completely around about way but like mm -hmm. What is the architecture of these people? Oh, they're Plumpland, they're plant people. They grow their architecture. What kind of people grow architecture? There's greenhouses, you know, and then there's, you know, people in the greenhouses. And instead of doctors, they have like bio recovery center and stuff like that. So uh, it, it's a lot about going through the architecture into the people. Nice. That's so cool. Nerd. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> If you were to participate in a year-long cultural exchange, which planet would you pick and why? Since we're talking about places, too. I mean, Broomagum, I think we all know. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Plant weirdo over here. Can I go I, to I think I would agree. Can you what? I'm going to go to Jumenji because they have, like, cool. jungles. And they also yeah. have volcanoes. So, like, that sounds like it would be fun. That does sound, it also sounds like it could potentially be terrifying and you're like, you've got like a panther chasing after you and then you run into a volcano and you're like, no, I'm in a volcano, no. But like fireproof tech and stuff. Ah, see, that's that's why I'm currently in the year 2019. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> you're right. I didn't think about that. We that's just have to invent it, you know, on the fly. <laughs> it has something to do with eggs and eggshells and um, you hatch them and now you're fireproof. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there's and you know there's so many like great places and like i i can't wait until people see more maps um because they really make like a place feel more real and i would definitely hang out in bruma gum because on on the map of bruma gum and maybe one of you can answer this for me because i don't know what the answer is um on like the bottom left corner there's a little beach and they're like plum plum on the beach having a bonfire. <laughs> and I'm like, what are they doing there? That's actually in the wiki. It oh. has a name and I don't remember what the name is because <laughs> Alice is actually the one who named it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's like in the location guide as um, the most romantic beach in all of Insula. Ooh. So, love it. Nice. Bam, chicka, wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess I will have to either cheat and read the wiki that is only available to me or find out with everyone else. So that's very exciting. <laughs> Does anybody in the chat have any additional questions? How about life, about the future, about <laughs> deep moral quandaries? Oh, oh, this is a good one from Neobari. Niobari, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your username. Since some of the maps are going to be available as prints, which one did each team member want to hang up in their house? And for me, I have both of them. I have both the Terragast and the Brumagum. Ah, see? Oh, Tr there they are. And then I've got the other one up. Ah, uh, all right. Yeah, I did By my diploma. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you needed that diploma to help you be as smart as you are so that you could make this game. So Thank you. So you're brilliant. <laughs> so i have yeah i have mine like i have both of them hanging up in the house they're like big and beautiful and we just we put the art on as many things as we can we have these hoodies that i'm wearing right now and it has i don't know yeah. if you can see that but i love our hoodies art in the lighting because i was like i'm doing this <laughs> this is happening it's gonna look great where did you sarah and julia you got yours yeah, mine are, mine are downstairs, uh, but I, I really want Avalonis, because it's going to be amazing. Yes. 
Because all of the maps will eventually also be available as canvases. Right now, we only have Brumagum and Terragast and their Kickstarter rewards, but you'll be able to get all of them eventually. Because Avalonis, that's going to be it's going to be good. The capital planet. <laughs> How about you, Julia? Uh, no, I'm I'm also super excited for Avalonis. That's the uh, the capital planet, so it's definitely more uh, cosmopolitan, more of a cityscape. You know, obviously the plants we have so far have been more, uh, you know, more wilderness, more jungle. Terragas is a mountainous planet, which and they look gorgeous. I love them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm super excited to see Avalonis. Same. I want to see it too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the idea of just like a metropolitan. That sounds awesome. It's very different from how, how varied do you plan for all of the maps to be? Are they all going to be like their own kind of different ecological type or we get planned or is it a secret can you not tell us um no they definitely yeah uh each of the plants definitely have their own kind of unique biosphere you know their their unique kind of footprint uh you might see some similarities but we we definitely kind of planned each plant to to be its own unique thing Awesome. Uh, just a quick thing. There's the planet uh, Braxicon, which is completely unlike any other planet we've talked about. Uh, one, because all of its inhabitants live underground. And two, because it's actually a spaceship that's piloted around by the Zibzab. Oh, the Zibzab. Can someone tell us about the Zibzab for anyone who doesn't know about the Zibzab? I don't know uh, that much about the Zibzab. Oh, yeah, Julia, sorry, take it. Oh, no, totally. <laughs> um, so the Zibzab are these smallish uh, potato-like creatures. They look like potatoes. They have kind of these stick <laughs> arms and legs. They take themselves very seriously. Um, they're really great at, at research and development. Uh, they're, they're extremely intelligent. Um, and they think they're, they think they're probably the, the best... I mean, doesn't everyone think they're the best, you know, the best uh, race of the Federation? Uh, but they very much think so. <laughs> they they kind of... They're, like, in the, your face about it? Yeah. They're like, oh, yes. Well, of I, course, we are better, but... I, I bet um, the humans are just kind of like, I'm just happy to be here. Yeah. And the Zibzabs are like, we own this place. Like, the humans are, like, the only people who are, like, not, like, we're the best. We're just yeah. like, we, we've been through some garbage. We know we're not great. We've made some mistakes, everyone. Sorry. Mistakes were made. <laughs> Um, there was a question also in relation to locations. Hold on. I got it. I got it. Oh, okay. Um, speaking of the maps, uh, someone said, I've seen some people having trouble sometimes to find where a location card goes. What tips do you have about that? You can do that one. So the way it's going to work is, you know, if you can match the pattern on the map, great. Go ahead and do that. But we're also giving information a location guide, which is going to say the grid coordinates on it. So, like, if you have the spaceport, it'll say in the location guide, spaceport I-4. And then you can use that in your um, situation to figure out which blurb you're getting to. Cool. So totally optional, right? Like, if you want to do the puzzle piece thing to find it, you can. Yeah, but for the people who are just like, no, you know what? I just want to know exactly where it is. You will have the option to. Yeah, your information officer will take care of that for you. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a really good just overall accessibility thing. Just, you know, if we're, we're always trying to think about, we had a couple of people at Gen Con that uh, had the colorblind problems that were like, I'm really struggling with this. And we were like, oh, we got to make it just easier for it everyone to get to the point we want them to get them to so it's all gonna work out it's gonna be great and uh the other question i have is what is the most important contribution that an actual cat has made to this game oh wow, wow. <laughs> that's deep yeah yeah I mean, I would say for sure, uh, Roast Beast, my three-legged cat, has been keeping me sane. Uh, and Dargo slash Boogers, he has two names that are both equally appropriate. Um, he <laughs> has kept me uh, thinking creatively uh, because he's so awful. And I just have to <laughs> solve so very many things just to stay sane and alive around him. So those are my 
contributions from my cats. I know that for sure. Pisces is... <laughs> I mean, like, I feel like Pisces and I, oh my God, Julia, the name of your cat is escape. Ivy. Pisces Ivy. and Ivy are like our mascots, basically, because <laughs> Pisces is so loud and Ivy is so adorable. <laughs> Ivy for, attends all of our meetings. She yep. Every the single truth. meeting, Ivy jumps up onto the table and is like, I'm here. Hello. What she most likes to do is to sit on my notebook. She kind of zeroes in on, on my notebook. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, she's like, oh, there's Julie's notebook, and she sits on it. And I'm like, Ivy, I was going to write stuff for the meeting. <laughs> no, I can't. I don't care. Full of I ideas. Have. <laughs> Thanks, Ivy. Yeah, I think my, my cat, Yoyogi, she doesn't really contribute much of anything, but I feel like when she comes into uh, my room and starts screaming, uh, it's just natural to start kind of talking about the Felici. Yeah. And we're like, how can we apply garbage cat behavior to the <laughs> Which are another one of my favorite Federation species because I think it was Trin during one meeting was like, what if instead of massage parlors, they had scritchin' parlors where you just got like ear scritches for like an hour? And I I'm still thinking about that. I think that was like months ago. And I'm just like still like, but what if a, an entire planet of cat people? Yeah, like when was it Julie? I think it was Julia said something like, "Okay, well, what what cat behaviors are are the Felici going to keep?" And so we just kind of like thought, like, what kind of weird cat behaviors? And the like the best thing was that they have kittens that are adorable, Aww. and they can become like Boy Scout and they wear little vests. It's the best. <laughs> anyway, they like to knock shit over. It's great. <laughs> sounds sounds right. Sounds exactly what we would expect. We called them the Floof Scouts. The Floof Scouts. They're on the Kickstarter page, even. Future um, leaders of our Felici, right? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Outstanding Felici? You should Something. Of, yeah. <laughs> you all come up with fantastic anagrams. Is that an anagram? Is that what that's called? It is a uh, uh, acronym. acronym. Acronym, yes. Sorry, anagrams when you flip all this. I've been playing a lot of Kingdom Hearts lately, so I'm just like, anagram. <laughs> uh-huh. It is an extremely reasonable mistake and only shows that you know a lot about the English language because you both know what anagrams and acronyms are. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so I think we are kind of, we're, we're coming to the end of, that was a, th- that was a whole thousand questions. Can you believe that? It was ah, amazing, yes. right? <laughs> if anyone else in chat has anything they would like us to discuss, now is your time. And while we're kind of waiting on that, if we want to go around, and I'm going to steal this from you, Trin, in your podcast, if there is any place you would like to find, you would like people to find you on the internet, now oh, is your yeah. time. Go ahead, Trin, you first. Oh, oh gosh. Um, yeah, you can find me at the internet. Uh, if at the internet. You can find me all, all up in the internet. Um, I'm on Twitter at... <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because Chris, who also worked on the game, is sending dumb messages and is making me laugh. Um, sorry. <laughs> you can find me uh, on Twitter at Trin and Tonic. So it's like a gin and tonic, but with a me inside of it. Um, and I'm also on a couple of podcasts. Um, QuestQuest.Best is our my D&D live play podcast where I play an anxiety teen elf. Uh, Friendshippingpodcast.com is where I talk about friendship. And I think you two would get along.com is Alana's going to be in that podcast tomorrow. It's oh my lunch. gosh. Uh, and we put uh, two games industry people into a room and make them be friends with each other. And the other guest was Christopher Bedell. And it was the most delightful conversation. Well, so uh, I had sorry. Fun. I took like 20 minutes to talk about No, the you're fine. You're good. <laughs> So everyone follow Trin everywhere because Trin is delightful. Thanks. Sarah. Um, you. I am not in many places on the internet. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter at SK underscore Sadie Kate. Um, and I post a lot about this game and not about much else. Uh, <laughs> but you can just catch up with me there. And that's that's it for me on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. That's okay. Oh. It's okay. I I similarly. Uh, So when I'm not in my hidey hole writing, uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Julia Urquhart, just at my full name. You can it's you can find it uh, on the Kickstarter page if you have trouble spelling it. Um, 
I have a great Twitter name. <laughs> <laughs> it's very professional. No, that's okay. Don't worry about it because my, my, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> oh no, my usual my usual uh, handle that I use was taken. So I was like, oh, I'll just take oh. my name then. No, that's all right. I was yeah. gonna say my Twitter handle is Stardust Shadow, and I sometimes talk about work. I talk about video games. I talk about costumes and just kind of just whatever. But mine is just like a very old username that I've had since the beginning of the internet. And I just keep using that username everywhere. I love it. It makes me very happy. (laughs) Everyone's always like, what is the deal with it? And it is mostly Sonic the Hedgehog related. The shadow is absolutely 1000% for Shadow the Hedgehog. This is my deep, dark secret. Now you all know it. And now the internet knows it. Here I am. You're... (laughs) You get better and better each time we speak. Okay, I'm so glad. <laughs> oh, it's such an internet weirdo. It's yeah, you are. It's great. That's true. No, I know. That's why, and that's why we get along. Like everybody, <laughs> even tangentially related to this this stream happening right now, is very strange. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> what I'm good with that. I feel that makes me like puff out my chest a little bit. I'm like, yes, I love being strange great it's way more fun and i think that we are good if anyone has any other questions or anything i mean who knows maybe we'll do another one of these before the kickstarter ends or just whenever we feel like it and uh, if you have any other questions feel free to talk to us on the kickstarter page if chris wants to put the kickstarter for a thousand one odysseys into the chat if you feel like checking it out or if you've already backed, you are awesome. Thank you so much for making all of this possible. We've already hit some stretch goals. We've got free crew member pins coming to everyone who's backed the game, which is awesome. We've got the achievements. We're working next on getting some guest writers that are going to have even more stories for us. So check it out if you get a chance. And um, thank you for being here. And if anyone has anything else they want to say, now is your time. You're welcome for talking. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you for obviously Trin, Sarah, and Julia for being here and chatting. Thanks for hosting us. It was a joy. (laughs) Alana, you were an incredible host. You did a really good job. Seriously. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Would (laughs) recommend. Aw, now I feel all nice and fuzzy, which is what the crew does. So I'm having such a fun time. Like, seriously, I feel like I keep saying this uh, every chance I have to when I'm, like, talking on the internet. But having such a fun time working with this group on this game. I'm so happy. You're all wonderful. Oh, oh. Oh. all these cuties in the chat i know thank you all of you you're all great your questions just your nice comments filling our days with sunshine thank you everybody good night yeah good night. all right see you later bye everyone